Hi, everyone, and welcome to Inventor's Launchpad, Roadmap to Success. I am Carmen Danisco, your host. And today on the Launchpad, we have a licensing expert. She's an entrepreneur. She's a business owner. She's also an inventor. She had products on QVC and retail before she got into the licensing business. She has probably personally put on hundreds of products on the as seen on TV space. We're going to get into how that relates to sales and what it means by the as seen on TV. Her name is Carrie Jeske, and I believe she's on the line right now. Hey, Carrie, over there. Hi, Carmine. Great to talk with you. Hi, Carrie. Thanks for being on the show today. And I did a quick little uh, uh, intro, I'm sure. And I just from reading your bio, you've done so much more. I just wanted to give the, uh, the listeners a little bit of what you've been going on uh, in the recent years. I also know that you're a part of uh, some invention um, clubs out in Kansas City. Is that correct? Well, I, um, I was part of the founding group of the Inventor oh. Center at KC back between maybe 2006, 2012, that time frame. And we grew the group. And now I'm doing an online co-inventing group. So it's kind of nice. Best of oh. both worlds. That's great, you know, because a lot of people sometimes can't go to those meetings. But being online, it makes it a lot easier to do, probably. Yeah, I think it's a great way to connect people all around the country, all around the world. You know, it's such a small world nowadays with online and people having access. So what I really want to do is bring together groups of people online. But then I also encourage face-to-face -face meeting because there still really is no substitute for the good old face-to-face. -face. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. I agree. Email, text, all that stuff. It just doesn't show any emotion. And being able to talk face-to-face -face and do that, that certainly helps. It's good for the intros and good for getting things done. But it's always, like you said, nice to meet face-to-face -face and talk and be able to see the people you're dealing with. Yeah, I think so. I think that's really great. You know, um, working with as seen on TV products, uh, you said I hundreds of products. I wish hundreds of products. Oh, okay. But really, you know, in the as seen on TV segment, it's like a home run kind of a play. So if we get one to four products a year. We're good. And the inventors are happy too. Yeah, well, that's probably still a lot. I mean, when I said that, I, I probably meant that you have seen a lot of products, uh, and, and I probably didn't say that correctly, but you're right. Uh, you probably see so many products, and, and let's split back up a little bit. I know we just jumped right into this, and I get kind of excited when I'm dealing with somebody who really knows the industry, and you've been doing this for many years. Maybe you can give us a little background on how you got into the industry and, uh, and where you're leading up to. Yeah, great. Thanks, Tom. Um... My husband and I is actually the inventor. I'm an inventor too, but he really kind of started the ball. He's an instructional engineer. And 15 years ago, I was president of a technology company and he was a structural engineer and we invented a little product out of playing softball. We were lifelong softball players. And we thought, well, you know, let's, let's make this product a success. Let's go into business together. So we kind of quit our jobs. We, we pretty much went in full board. We had a little friends and family investor meeting one Saturday afternoon and you know, we invited maybe 150 people, uh, 40 people said they'd come, 25 actually showed up. And of the 25, we raised about 250,000 in that one afternoon. So that was uh, pretty good. Uh, we had a lot of credibility with our friends and family. And so we started our company and that product did pretty well. We got it on QVC, we got it in HS, or not HSN, but we got it on QVC, we got it in Sports Authority, Cabela's. Uh, Sam's Club, Costco, and it had a nice ride. Um, it's still on the market today, but it's bell curve of all products kind of dipped around 2012, 2013. But during that time, I really learned so much. And I think I probably made every mistake you could make with that product. I mean, I, I'm a, a school of hard knocks learner. So, you know, we did it all wrong, but we were able to pick ourselves up and, you know, dust ourselves off and keep going again. And in that process, the inventors group came about. I started hearing what other kind of options there were with licensing. Realized, wow, make and sell is not the only uh, you know, way to go to market. And actually, it could be more lucrative to license. And then I met the guys at Will It Launch. And we established a trust and a relationship over many years where they were uh, funding some contests I was running. And I got to you know, just develop a comfort level with them. And then I came on board about three and a half years ago. and and I've loved helping people ever since. Wow, what a story. I mean, we were talking about your first product that you invented. I mean, you actually got funding through friends and family, which is everyone talks about. And that was a lot of money that you raised. And then you got the product into retail. And as you know, being in the industry now, I mean, certainly you made some mistakes, but that's amazing with the first product, right? 
well, everybody told me you can't get into retail with a single SKU product, but sales was my background. So I had that going for me. I'd kind of come up through the ranks of corporate America and the sales and management side. So I wasn't afraid to call companies. It was easy to get to the buyers. I usually could, you know, pester somebody enough to get a conversation and a lot of prayer, a lot of, you know, marketing materials that were sent, trade shows. We did the whole gamut. But um, getting in the stores is not nearly as hard as getting the product to sell once it is in the store. Mm. So that was another lesson learned because I got it in a lot of stores and they'd buy a first run order, but then my merchandising positioning was so poor. We had a, a real long, narrow box, like an 80 inch box, cause it was a big awning and it was maybe a four inch by four inch. It was a long, narrow box. And you know, they would shove me down at the bottom of the shelf on the lowest possible point. And, and then my price point was higher than the competitors. They, they'd have my price point there at like 169. And then they'd have my competitor on sale for 99, you know, right above me in a giant display because they were a bigger company. So yeah. they had better logistics. So then I found myself on the phone to the store manager level, you know, please, what can we do to move my product? And, you know, just clawing and scraping and begging and whatever I could do. But, you know, through it all, I started to realize who bought my product. And this is another really important point. When we invented the product, we invented it out of a baseball softball because that was our need, our problem solution. But I realized that ladies that show dogs were actually the primary buyer. And I realized that more through direct sales than retail. And I was actually making more on the direct sales. Wow. These ladies would call, you know, on Friday or Thursday and they would say, I've got to have it overnight and I'll pay extra for the shipping overnight. And I'd be like, what are you doing? And Oh, dog show, going to dog show where they're all weekend. And then Monday or Tuesday of that week, I would get all these orders because these ladies had bought it. They'd be out showing their dog and they, they're more of an affluent group. It's women who buy things. And, and they started just sharing it. And then I'd get all these orders and I start thinking, well, I need to be targeting the dog shows instead of going to these big, you know, $5,000 uh, wholesale trade shows for buyers where I'm actually not making that much on the margin. I can go direct and pay 50 bucks and go to a dog show, have way fewer people that I'm targeting, but I'm selling, you know, three times the amount and making more on every one. Wow, that's amazing. So, I mean, being able to watch that, know, know who your target market is and then have it transition to someone else, th th that learning process is, is great that you noticed it. A lot of people would maybe wouldn't have noticed that and been still targeting, you know, basically the wrong, not the wrong demographic, but the smaller demographic. Yeah, I think the advantage, um, that, that is one of the advantages of being a, you know, when you, I, I left a presidency of a tech company and I thought, you know, it was big stuff and knew everything there was to know. And I found out quickly, I really didn't. And then, you know, I found out suddenly I'm the janitor, I'm the shipping clerk, I'm the flyer girl, I'm customer service agent, you know, I'm, I'm everything and with no title, <laughs> it doesn't matter anymore. Okay. And um, so, you know, you have to listen, you have to listen to what's happening. And so I thought that was, uh, that was good. That was good advice. And now that ability to listen to customers is what it makes me so excited about as seen on TV because there's a market viability testing that people can really benefit from that's earlier than than all the manufacturing and all of the order fulfillment and the warehousing so I think inventors can save a lot of money and find out way more information up front yeah you know that's a, that you bring up a great point and it's funny it's, I always have this question I'm going to ask and then as you're mentioning things I'm like oh that's a better question <laughs> you know yeah. there, there's so much in this industry there, there really is. And, and there's so much knowledge, so much education and everything. Everybody's learning things. I, I learn something about the industry every day that I think I know. Um, a lot of the inventors that come to myself and probably that you come, they, they, they have this notion in their head of their, who their perfect you know, customer is. And is, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Or they should allow somebody like yourself to be able to really figure that market out. And there's their ways to do that. Yeah, I think it's a good thing to begin with because you invented the product out of a problem that you had and there's a solution for that. So I think it's good to have some idea. I, I actually call that um, fishing for fishing in the dark. You've got all these ponds. I think of it as like all these ponds out there and they have fish in them, but you don't know which has the most fish and you don't know if they're biting on your bait. So you sort of have to fish somewhere for a little while and see if it's working. 
And then if it is, then you want to stay. But if it's not working, maybe you ought to, you know, pick up and move to a different pond and check it out. So I do think it's important to know that, but you've got to be open to change. With As Seen on TV, there is a market viability testing process that is proprietary to our category. So it's not that it would be so relevant in any other distribution channel, but it's time tested for As Seen on TV. And when I say As Seen on TV, I'm talking about a section of shelves at the store. So this process is where we basically do surveys, we do web tests, and we do two minute commercials uh, testing targeted as seen on TV existing buyers, which is pretty much the 40 to 75 year old woman buys the majority of products. Also, it's a home run play. It's not uh, a niche kind of a, a traditional play. It's more of a, if this thing's gonna take off, it's gonna take off big. So we need to hit the mass market, which is pretty much women buy most of the things. But these surveys tell us, it, are people resonating with the problem that it solves? The web tests tell us, are they willing to spend money on the product? And then the two minute tests tell us any number of things. That's really the grand poo -paw of all the tests. And it tells us everything from buyer intent to what are the features benefits people are biting on to are the profits there before we roll out because it's a pretty expensive endeavor. So you wanna get that math right early on. Mm. And I think the, the information that I learned about target marketing through my sports shade experience and through what I've seen has made me just fall in love with the as seen on TV market viability testing process. Because I think it's so valuable for people to understand who their market is and not just who their market is, but why. Why are people buying your product? What is the hot button? you know, solution or feature that they're resonating with. Yeah. And it seems like you can get down to that or, or drill down to that feature fairly quickly. I mean, the process that you just explained, is it, is it a long drawn out process or is it something you do before you even, you know, put inventory into it? Yeah, it can be done both ways, but I think for the average independent inventor, it's better to do with a well-made prototype. If they have a well-made prototype that we can uh, shoot a two minute commercial on and make it look market ready. Um, in, in our category, we're talking about physically small products that solve everyday problems. So it's easy to manufacture these products. That's not hard. They're not a lot of materials. They're not, you know, uh, solving world hunger. They're little gadgets. It's all everyday problems. So we can get away with testing prior to manufacturing. And then when we get orders to fill, we can fill those fairly quickly, um, you know, with a small production run. And, and that's already set up. But the whole process can actually take under 120 days wow. to find out a lot of information. And then our launch sequence, the fastest I've seen is about six months that we can be literally on the store shelves. I'm talking all Walmarts, CVS, Walgreens, which is very, very fast. Um, yeah. The longest is about 18 months. And that's because, you know, maybe the testing data came back where we needed to look at this or that. We needed to tweak it a little bit and, and position it better. I, I do have one, another story. I don't want to talk too long, but I have another quick story to tell you. Go ahead. So on the, the windshield wonder, a lot of people know that product. Oh, I don't have it behind me, but it's, it's basically a chamois on a stick. It's a brilliant product, but we tested that product a lot of different ways. It's, it's a product that cleans windows. And so we tested it on the sliding glass door, on the windows, on the mirrors, you know, all around the house. But consumers just didn't resonate with it, with those features and benefits being tested. It wasn't until we, we got to the automobile, the inside of your dash on your automobile, where it's kind of difficult to get your hand back there. You know, that was the hot button. And when we tested that, all of a sudden the sales went through the roof because that was a problem that people were willing to spend money to solve. And that made the difference. So we changed the whole two minute spot to focus predominantly on that one feature because you don't have that much time in a two minute spot. And then we mention the other things briefly, but we don't really have to mention them because consumers are smart. They're gonna buy it because that's a problem that they wanna pay to solve. But then of course they're gonna use it for their sliding glass door and their mirror and all the other things that you know are kind of obvious. So finding the dominant purchase pain point is such a critical thing for inventors. And that's why if you are an inventor and you've already made product or you're actually already selling product at trade shows, that's good experience you're building because you're listening to people when they come up. And when you're actually selling product, 
ask them, what is it about this that made you want to buy it? You know, you can ask people information and they're very willing to share with you why they're doing what they're going to do. And that's, that's really important to do. I also recommend getting video testimonials while you're out there too, because that'll help. Yeah. Well, well, you, you have hit several points in that story. One is you have to be open to change. I mean, you can't think of everything. Your product is going to be, it could be a great product, but if you're going after the wrong market or if you're explaining it the wrong way, no one's going to get it. So you, you have to be able to change the way you're doing things or the way people are looking at it. That's awesome. And then the product itself. I mean, you don't think and don't be so stringent about what your product's for because it's a living thing. You know, just like the iPhone, when they first came out with the iPhone, they could never have imagined how many uses it's for now. And so it, it, it's, it's great. That's a great story, a great way to tell people you could have a great idea, but don't be, don't be close to change. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, that's, that's, that's awesome. Now the ad seen on TV space, first of all, I mean, from anywhere from six to 18 months, that's, that's a great way to, because here at the launch pad, we get a lot of people that come in, they say, well, I need to get a, a purchase order. And, you know, they think that when they get a purchase order, they're, they're getting product, in, you know, into a store in two or three months and, you know, just getting an appointment with a buyer, right? I mean, what kind of time is that just to get a, an appointment with a buyer? It must be a, lo- a while. Well, that's traditionally on the make and sell strategy um, when inventors are trying to do that. Yeah, that can take a while. And that's a really good point you make because if I could just contrast the difference between the make and sell strategy, my first product versus licensing. So what I experienced was uh, I I raised money, I had funding, and then I had some debt and I could access to capital, which I was in a pretty good position. And then, uh, but you make the product, your manufacturer wants to be paid. And so you're paying him right after you get the product, but then it's on the slow boat from China, that's 30 days. And then by the time you ship it out to the retailer, this is best case scenario when you've got orders, you fulfill the orders. And then, so that takes another 30 days and then they agree to pay you. And so that's, you know, they say they'll pay you in 30 or 60. They really pay you in 90 or 120. And then what happens when you get paid is, so you floated the money, best case scenario, no problems. You floated the money, you know, probably six months from you know the date that you made it to the date that you're getting paid that's a long time to run with no cash and then what happens is a lot of the retailers they'll give you chargebacks and so you know with cabela's for example i love cabela's uh, but all of these retailers do this they send me a three inch book full of uh you know all the ways that the bar graph has to be put on the box you know within certain parameters because they're an operational you know machine they got to have it come a certain way because they're churning through products So I've got to, you know, from me and my friends in the warehouse, stick the bar graph, you know, onto the right spot. And if you don't do it just right, they charge you back on your invoice. You have to pay them for your mistake. And so all of a sudden, my manufacturer wants more money. My retailer buyer is saying, you've got to sell it for less. Everybody's squeezing. And all of a sudden, I'm the one doing all this work for, uh, you know, for not as much money. Whereas when you license, uh, if you take that IP right from the beginning and then uh, give it to a company like ours, you don't have to do the manufacturing. You don't have to talk to the retail buyers. You don't have to do any of the order fulfillment. All you do is sit back and give us your two cents on why your product's so great. And then we're going to take the ball and run with it, do the testing. We'll fund the manufacturing. We're going to fund the operational rollout. We're going to bring in the right partners, the right strategic allies the right people needed. And we're just going to send you a check in the mail. So, you know, you sit back and enjoy your life. Now, because we're dealing in home runs, that check can be significant. And in as seen on TV royalty, an inventor could end up making, you know, two to 4 million over a a five, three to five year period, which is pretty nice when you don't have any risk and any skin in the game. Now that's different than other types of licensing. I do other licensing in other categories. And I think a lot of times inventors have a misunderstanding about how much they're really going to make. If you're talking, you know, a smaller rollout, like, I'm sorry, let me just contrast. For as seen on TV, we're going to sell five to eight million units per year for a short life cycle of one to five years. So that's a lot. That's a home run. That's a ton of product we're moving. Every other place in the store, they're not going to sell that many units. If they sell a couple hundred thousand units, that's pretty good. If they sell a half a million units or a million units, that's nothing to be ashamed of. So the inventor's royalty on that is going to be significantly less. Average numbers that I see 
our inventors making 20,000 a year on licensing and non-traditional products. If you make 50,000 a year, that's great. That's a million, uh, about a million units, a million dollars in revenue that a company's making and the inventor might get a 5% royalty, they maybe make 50,000 a year. Not bad, that's a pretty good part-time job to make, you know, and, and then every now and then you get lucky, you get the 150s, the 200s, and then you get up into the millions. So that's how non as seen on TV licensing goes. In as seen on TV though, you know, you're talking a significant amount of money in a very short period of time. So, and the costs to get in are so much less because you don't need a patent. If you have one, that's great. Um, there is a time for patenting, but you don't need it. All we need is a well-made prototype and a smartphone demo video, and you can easily show me your idea and I can say yes, no, or maybe, and then at least you have some quick advice. Mm. Well, that's why the as seen on TV space is, is so great for inventors. And I agree with you because you can move quickly. There, there isn't as much risk for the inventor. There, you don't have to have as much you know, funds, layouts and much funds. If they have a good prototype, you can get them going so quickly. And you know, the proof of concept is much faster than the general, the, the general licensing route because just licensing a product out of the as seen on TV space could take months alone. Whereas you know a product pretty quickly, right? I mean, what type of products are you looking for? You know pretty quickly if that product's going to fly. Yeah, I do. Um, I, I can't say that I know what will be the next winner. Yeah. That's the thing we joke at. I, I wish. I wish I could. Um, we don't know. The consumer market's fickle. We don't know what they're going to buy. All we really know is what they have not bought in the past and what they have bought in the past. Yeah. So we have a lot of data. And so everything going on in the industry, no matter who, who's doing it, you know, it's a small industry and there's some big players that uh, we partner with that are predominant in operational rollout, but we're all looking at what everybody's doing. Sometimes companies are your competitors, sometimes they're your strategic ally. So it's a small kind of fairly closed community really, but I look at probably 30 to 50 products definitely a week and sometimes a day. So it's amazing to me how many similar ideas I'll get from people at different parts of the world that I know don't know each other, yet their concepts are amazingly similar to one another. And then also I've got product scout team and they're looking at products uh, on the public domain, on crowdfunding, at trade shows and everywhere else, and they're sending me products. So I'm looking at a lot of product. And if, I, if you tell me an idea or you tell me a problem that you're trying to solve, Usually, if you just tell me the problem you're trying to solve, I can guess what the solution is because I've probably seen several other attempts to solve that problem. And I have information about whether consumers are going to pay to solve that problem because that's a whole separate issue. You know, we can all agree that coming out of the, uh, the grocery store with plastic bags hurting my hands is a problem. You know, especially for women, it, it's kind of a pain. Sure. Yet, I've seen every type of plastic grocery bag holder that you could possibly imagine lots have been tested and they haven't made it so you know if you're an inventor that's in information that's really really valuable and that's something i share every month in my inventing workshop i told you that nonprofit that i uh, host a meeting where we co-invent things and that's information i share because i'm talking to not just the as seen on tv community i'm talking to outside the as seen on tv community and i'm hearing what comp what products uh, traditional companies are testing that don't go anywhere that fail and this is information so valuable to an inventor to have early on because if you're a medium to large size company and you test a product and it fails you probably didn't get a patent on it because you did this early stage testing to see if it's worth investing time and money if it fails you're not going to get a patent so it's not going to come up on your patent search and it's also not going to come up on your google amazon search because they never launched it it didn't it didn't fly in the early stage testing, so they didn't put any more money to it. So that's information, it's sort of, I call it the dark hole out there, where you just don't know as an inventor what you don't know. This is where I love to offer value to inventors, and I will tell inventors if I've seen things, it doesn't mean I'm the know-all be-all of inventing, I, I certainly do not have all the information about inventing, but if I can give them additional insight and let them know at least what did not work for someone else, now you're making an educated risk. If you're an inventor, part of being an inventor is you see things other people don't see. You know things other people don't know. So just because somebody gives you some uh, negative advice doesn't mean that they're right, and it doesn't mean that you don't have a way that'll make it work. But I want to at least give people the information to know uh, go or no-go decisions, because I, I do talk to a lot of people, and often 
you know, people have cashed in their 401ks, they've taken their kids' college education, you know, they've spent a lot of money, 50 to 80 to 150,000 is common. And, and there are ideas that maybe somebody should have given them some hard truth about early on. That's what I want to do for people. I don't want to see people waste their money. I want to see people place good bets and make sound um, risk and reward, you know, conscious decisions. And then if, if it takes off, yay, it takes off. If it doesn't, at least you try. You know, there's no shame in trying. Try again. <laughs> No, no, and I, I, I agree with you 100%. And that's kind of why I wanted to have you on the show because, you know, your vast experience um, and, and a lot of the people we have on the show, they have great experience in, in their space. And, and one of the biggest spaces is licensing products, but then the as seen on TV space is big too. And you kind of combine both of those, which is so important. And I agree with you a lot of times people should look into licensing. There's, there's no doubt about it, but they have to, they have to be open. Again, we talk about, again, to change and getting information, talking to somebody that really knows the space. And if you've seen the products before, so, you know, again, you can't do it on your own. We talk, I talk about this every, on every show. You cannot do it on your own. You can invent things, you can have ideas, but you need to talk to people that know that have been in the space for a while and they could not only save you time, but a whole lot of money. I mean, that's the, that's the most important thing is to have those funds. Yeah, exactly. You know, I think too about licensing is even if you go into it thinking you're going to go the make and sell route, uh, if you're if you're going to build, uh, you know, a, a twenty million dollar or less business, uh, you might not get you know any competition from a major player. But if you really do have the next big product, no matter what your category is, you're going to get market competition. There are going to be companies that come, and either it's a direct replica of your product, or it's a close enough you know, non-infringing patent replica or problem-solving product that competes with you. And when big, big companies, they're going to compete hard. So I, I do encourage that you think about licensing, no matter what your intention is when you get into it. If a big billion dollar company comes calling and they want to license your product, I say, get married, marry for the money, take it and go live your happy life and let them run with it. Because if you don't uh, partner with them, you are, in, in effect, choosing to compete with them. And most inventors are just not equipped to compete with a big company. So I love licensing in that way. I think it's a better, I mean, I love it because I think inventors that do it well can make a lot more money for a lot less risk. They don't think that up front. They still think make and sell sometimes is a better way to go. But if it's really a, a big, big revenue selling item, you're doing yourself a service to get it in the hands of a, a well-established company that already has all the processes in place, can move faster and can compete with those competitors, you know, with them being your bouncer now, instead of being your competitor, they're going to actually sort of be a forerunner for you and, and take that thing by storm and you're on the team. So that's a better way to go. Definitely. 100%. That's <laughs> just great advice because there's no reason to do that. I mean, to get the check, Go get on a beach, lay on, don't worry about it because you can't do it as those big companies. You can either, like you said, you can compete with them or you can go with them. And it's one of those things where you can't beat them, join them. And they got billions of dollars to spend. So you're exactly right. Um, yeah. You know, and I tell, I, I talk to our inventors and they're so worried about someone copying their idea or someone doing it there. You, if yours have, as you said, if you have a successful product, they are going to copy you. And I mean, it's, it's a form of flattery, but it's going to want to be those things. You can't stop it. You can't stop it. You need to hit the market as hard as you can or license and, uh, and try to get rid of the competition that way. So I agree with you. Hey, I'm glad you mentioned that because that fear of somebody stealing their idea sometimes also prevents people from getting the right partner at the right time. So in my experience, the big companies are not going to copy your idea. If you have an idea or you have a little prototype, that's not what they're copying. They're, they're copying products that are doing well. So if you've got a viral video, you've funded crowdfunding campaign, you're on the public domain, you're at some risk in, in that regard. But they mostly want to work with the inventor. So if you'll be friendly and likable and sign a deal, they will pay you your royalty and it won't be a problem. You know, you can get on the bandwagon. Um, the other side of the coin is when you do have your initial idea, don't be so paranoid that the people in the inventor community are going to steal that because I, I, my experiences are not. I've been in the inventing community for 15 years. I travel around the country, go to inventor clubs, crowdfunding groups, and I talk to most of the people, most of the service providers and inventors around that you'll find. 
they're well-meaning, good-intentioned people. They're, they don't want to steal your idea. They want to work with you. They want to help with you. They will sign non-disclosures. So if you're very concerned about it, go ahead and get somebody to sign a non-disclosure and then tell them your idea and at least listen to their feedback. You don't have to buy a service for them. I think, you know, I guard my cash like a junkyard dog. So I'm not uh, one to just spend money willy-nilly. You know, I'm much more fiscally conservative, but I want to listen to people. I want to hear what they've got to say and get that good advice. You do not have to run to a patent attorney right away. Um, most people patent at step one because they're so afraid somebody's going to steal their idea. Really, patenting is step four. Um, I don't know if you're aware, the inventor, you are, I know, <laughs> but most inventors, 90% of patents issued never make the inventor a dime. That's a big st a stat. And it's because inventors patented at step one and they really should have waited till step four. So don't be afraid to share your idea with people in the inventor community that are going to help you. Get NDAs if you feel more comfortable, but get the wisdom that you need before you spend money. You've got to look at the cash that you've got to invest and you've got to think, this is, this is gold, this is fuel, it's gas, and you only have a limited amount. So you don't want to just throw it, you know, off at the wrong thing. You know, actually what I say, it's you're buying the right thing at the wrong time. Hmm. That's what inventors are doing. They're buying the right thing at the wrong time. Yeah. And, and again, don't let fear stop you from moving your product forward. I don't know about you, um, Carrie, but uh, I've been doing this a long time and I don't recall ever somebody telling me that a company has stolen their idea. I know people have been fearful of it, but I can't recall a company stealing an idea. You know, um, I see a couple of things now more than ever with the crowdfunding where I do see that the, there's a lot of Asian competition on crowdfunding sites. And, and I, I have sometimes people tell me that people are, but usually they're wrong. I mean, usually what they're telling me is they had an idea that they never did anything with, and then a big company came out with that similar idea. So it's not like a company really stole their idea. You know, it's somebody got to market and actually did something with it before they did anything with it is the more common thing. Yeah. You know, and, and occasionally in a licensing agreement, the other thing I'll see that say that's legitimate is in a licensing agreement that is done. A lot of inventors, uh, they don't really get help for how to write their licensing agreement and, or, or sometimes attorneys are, you know, worried too much about the tittle and the tat. And sometimes if you don't get audit rights in there, I have seen situations like the guy that did the, um, the big giant squirt gun. What was that guy's name? He was like a NASA inventor, a real smart guy. And they took his technology and used it on another product line. And that was, he should have been paid for those royalties. And I think he got like 185 million. So, you know, you see something like that, but I agree with you hundred percent that in the beginning, I have never had anybody tell me that somebody took their idea, you know, and ran with it. It just doesn't happen. So yeah. don't be afraid of that. Get the help you need. Yeah, fear. Fear will definitely slow your process down. There's no doubt about it. And of course, as um, as you said, uh, spending your funds or spending your resources in the at the wrong time or in the wrong place will slow you down. Also, <laughs> so I, yeah, yeah. I want to change gears. We're we're kind of getting low on time here, and this is such an important um, session or episode because licensing again is is a big is a big way for inventors to move their product forward very quickly, and especially at the ad scene on TV, uh, which I see popping up more and more in stores. Uh, it's something oh, that you yeah. must have noticed that trend. Is it popping up? Oh, it's growing. Yeah, there was just an article written. It used to be that we were a $350 billion un industry. And I, I can't remember what the growth percent is, but it's pretty significant. And that's the thing. How you know if a, a category is doing well is where it's positioned in the store. Our, our section of shelves is always way at the front. It's because more products flying off that section of shelves more than any other section of shelves in the store. And it is in part because of the massive media campaigns that are done. So it's a good, it's a good space to be in. I really think it's important for inventors to, you know, get in, get in quick. Let me look at their idea. I, I like first look when, when I try to tell my inventors, when I'm building a team of collaborative inventors and product scouts and, and I'm willing to share inside information. I'm as transparent as I can be. I'll tell you the truth. And what I want in return is I want first look because it's highly competitive. And you know, you don't want two products from two different competitors that solve the same problem going out 
at the same time because then everybody makes less, everybody had the same operational costs. So first look and the ability of, of my team to be able to test the products early on. And if we can get traction, you know, we will take it by storm. And if we can't, then you know what? It, it was a good learning experience. You can still go on and sell your product in any number of other categories. And now you have a lot more information. So there's really no risk to the inventor to do it. It's just uh, my criteria is narrow, physically small products. The shelf space is very narrow, so I can't have physically big item. It's gotta be minimal packaging. It's gotta be about under $50 retail. That's what I look for. And then it has to solve a mass market problem. It can't be something for biking or for grilling out. It's really gotta be a mass market kind of a product. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was gonna be one of my questions is, you know, the type of types of products that you're looking for um, and you kind of explain that in a sense, the, the mass marketing and everyone thinks that, and you probably hear this, I say, well, who's your product target market? And they say, everyone in the world. Yeah. <laughs> and I say, don't, don't tell anybody else that. <laughs> yeah, right. But you, you are looking for products that are um, large scale, you know, usable products. Now they, they solve like, uh, uh, is it our home products better, outdoor products? I mean, is it, does, it, does it matter in that sense? No, um, people always ask about the categories. And when I talk, you know, I'll give a list of categories, but that's less important than the unique factor. Something that's unique is really important. And this is a distinct difference because um, in most traditional shelves in the store, they don't, they want, they want a lot of SKUs. They want to take up space with a variety of items. In our category, we don't want competitors and we don't want a lot of SKUs because we're going we're gonna to drive consumer traffic through the media. So we need a product that's unique. It's got to be something that you can't buy somewhere else. The worst thing for us would be to spend, you know, $3 million on a media campaign and then have you go buy a backpack at the backpacks place. You know, our, our product has got to be so unique that it stands out in your mind. We call it the wow factor. What's the wow factor that stands out in your mind that makes you think, oh, I've got to buy it from the As Seen on TV section of shelves because that's the only place that's available. So that's really important, that wow factor. And sometimes it's just a matter of marketing. I mean, we have launched products that have actually been on the store shelves in other areas, not selling that great for a long time. And it's just a clever marketing angle that comes up and all of a sudden something blows up. So it doesn't actually have to be a new item. It just has to be a unique selling proposition that creates value that is solving a pop problem people are willing to solve. That's great. One of the things that when I'm shopping, who's ever shopping with me, I drive them crazy because I'm always circling the as seen on TV shelves. Look to see what's new out there. <laughs> oh, me too. And I love it when people on my social networks, if you take pictures and post them on my social networks or send them to me, I love that. I love to make my Facebook uh, inventors corner with Carrie Jeske. I love to make that, where, you know, you can post pictures from the Walmart in Tampa or, or whatever. <laughs> you know, it's just fun. It just is fun. There. It really is. It really is. So we'll wind down a little bit here. Um, one question that I do want to ask, and, you know, some of the listeners may have, to work with you, to get started with you, is there any cost? Um, good question. Um, we've got three different kinds of agreements. So for most independent inventors that have a lot of ideas, don't want to put a lot of money into their product, you would want in option one, the fully funded licensing agreement. For that, there is no cost, there's no submission fees, there's not, no charge to you at, uh, of any kind. What I need from you is a well-made prototype, the best quality prototype that you can possibly make. I need it to look market ready. And then I need you to shoot a, a two minute or less demo video with your smartphone, it doesn't have to be professional, but with your smartphone, post it on YouTube in an unlisted setting, and then just email me a link. And when you email me a link, don't send me the big file. I need you to post it on YouTube in an unlisted setting. Send me the link, put the name of the product in the subject line. That'll allow me to track conversations about that product. I'll give you feedback. I'll try to respond pretty quickly and let you know what I think. And then if it's a win, we'll fund it all and pay you a royalty, and we're off to the races. Uh, second type of agreement would be more for 
uh, somebody that's already put some money in their product. If you've already spent money on patents, you've already spent money maybe on manufacturing or a big crowdfunding campaign, or you don't really want the full licensing, but you know you don't necessarily want to take it all yourself, you kind of want to partner. We will let those uh, types of inventors buy in for a seat at the table, so to speak, and they can help us uh, offset the cost of some of the testing camp campaigns. And for that um, money that they're investing in that, they would own the assets, so they would get to see some of the data and they would have access to it. They're kind of uh, on the team, on the creative team. And that's uniquely different because when you're fully licensing, and this is true of any category, you fully license, generally the inventor is not involved. The big company knows what they need to know. They don't really need the inventor's help and the inventor's not paying any money. So then the company will just take the ball and run with it. With a partnership, you're kind of buying in for a seat at the table. So you want to be involved and you want to learn. And so we have that option for those people and that's on a case-by-case -case basis because there is a risk to it. And, and you know, in any, any way that you spend money in inventing, there's always a, the option that you could lose that money. So I think that you need to be aware of that because it's up to consumers. And that's the same as, as anybody. But you want to place your bets wisely. And if you've got a mass market product and you want to be involved and you want to make a little more, be at the part of the table, that's money well spent. Um, the third type of agreement would be more of a consulting agreement. And this is what Traditional manufacturers are coming to us now, small and mid-sized traditional manufacturers that want to just pay for us to do the two-minute TV test. It's about a $50,000 investment. Wow. But the alternative for them is that if their product does not succeed, what they're doing now is they're spending two years and a half million dollars to find that out, to put the store all the way on the shelves, have people walk by, nobody buys it, they eat it back. Now they're kind of wising up on some of these products that we can help with that meet our criteria and they're saying hey let me just pay you we already have distribution we have buyer relationships with manufacturers we don't really they don't need us for that but they do need us to run the test and so we'll run the test and then we won't take any royalty they get all of the profits from their product we take I think I think it's some kind of a small uh, media buy fee that we would get going forward so that's an opportunity for small and mid-sized manufacturers or companies that already have distribution to find out in under 120 days if they've got something. That's fantastic. You're exactly right. Here they are. Like you said, they're going to spend millions of dollars, several years. Now they can do this within a few months. Even $50,000 to one of these big companies is, is nothing compared to what they would have spent. And then they have all that inventory they can't get rid of anyway. Exactly. Right. Oh, it's amazing how much money that they'll spend on on a product. And that's what I tell inventors too, is if you can, if you can test early on, if you test with me with TV products, that's great. But if it's a different category product, test before manufacturing. Because what happens so often is inventors will buy a, I call it a garage full of them. They'll go to China, they'll buy a garage full of them, and then they get it and then they run out and start selling it. And the market says, we love your product, but it's green. And I'd really love it if it were in blue, but you got a garage full of green. And you can't, you don't have any money left. So you can't make your product a different color. So now you don't like your product anymore because everybody wants it a different color than you've got. Yet you've got to sort of shove this other color down their throat because you need to recap that cash to buy your next one. If you could just find out more information prior to making the manufacturing choice, you know, everybody would be much better off. Uh no doubt about it. And, you know, you don't want people stuck with a, with a garage full of products. There's, there's no doubt about it. That's why testing and numbers, it, it just doesn't lie. So I, I, I agree 100%. Any inventors are out there that are going to place an order for product, you know, get some feedback, get some information before you do that. There, there's no doubt about it. So, so Kai, we're pretty much out of time. I want to just ask you to let the listeners know um, how they can get in touch with you. Um, all the information that you're giving is going to be available on Inventors Launchpad uh, show notes. So if you're driving and Carrie's giving some URLs or website stuff, you don't have to stop and write it down because we'll have all that information. But just in case, Carrie, why don't you go ahead and give away for people to get in touch with you? Thanks. Uh, three websites. Willitlaunch.com is the first one, as seen on TV products. Great. Inventive Ideas is non as seen on TV products. And inventingworkshop.com is the co-inventing. Every month, jump online with me and we'll invent some stuff together and see if we can license it. Um, Carrie at willitlaunch.com is my email. It's C-A-R-R-I-E at willitlaunch.com. Best email to get me out. My phone number's everywhere online. Yeah, I'm not hard to find. I've lived in the same town for 30 years and <laughs> for 
30 years, you know, look me up. I'm out there and uh, connect with me online. I'd love to talk with you and answer your questions. And most importantly, I'd love to see your product ideas and find the next winner with you and have you be it. That's great. As you guys can see, Carrie's not fooling around. She's got a website for everything you need. To get in touch with her. Send in your center, your information. And she is very, very active on social media, which I think is great. She's very reachable, very approachable. Um, give you feedback without a problem. I've seen her work with several inventors online uh, like it was nothing. So I have no problem with that. You know, reach out to her definitely. Uh, Carrie, thank you so much for being on the show today. Um, we hope to invite you back. Let us know if anything big comes up. I know you're always working on some great products and we'd always like to hear about them. Yeah, thanks. Keep in mind the 60 second salad, next one up in Bed Bath & Beyond. Look for that 60 second salad. It went viral. I wish you would have mentioned more about it, but you'll see it. It'll be out in a big way. Wow, that's great. Okay, okay. And we'll mention on our show notes. Thank you so much for that heads up. Thanks. All right, Kat, you take care. Thanks. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.